I had to laugh at Joe's comment about the furnace. There are probably arguments going on between spouses in the various homes represented here about who controls that furnace and when it's turned on. We won't talk about that this morning, but um, I can remember on the streets of Cairo where we lived on the, the south side of the city in a little suburb called El Ma'adi, and it used to be the King's Garden, and it was one of the places where as we visited, that it was one of the few green places in the city where instantly you recognize uh, the green of the trees where everything else tends to be brown, uh, dusty, um, high-rise apartment buildings. And we were fortunate enough to be able to live there for a period of time. But on Road 9, where I would walk to jump on the, the metro to commute into work, um, there was a restaurant, and I think it was a... I don't know anything about Game of Thrones, but I think it was a Game of Thrones themed restaurant and it said, winter is coming. Now imagine walking down the streets of Cairo, it's summertime, it's 120 degrees and you see this sign that says winter is coming and you just have to laugh. Um, but winter is coming and um, this last week, uh, my father came in to visit us uh, he has his priorities straight, so he brought his disc golf discs, and we stopped in the Metro Park, and, and on the way to pick up the children on Friday, we, we pulled off and took a few minutes to walk through the park, to throw some discs, and to just enjoy these mature stands of oak trees uh, with the sun shining through and the carpet of golden leaves, and uh, it just made me thankful to be uh, back in the state of Michigan this time of year. But it's not all fun and games, and uh, we will be addressing that here shortly as we do. Uh, I'd like to invite you once more to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to be here. Uh, thank you for your church, not just a physical temple that has been planted here, but your living body uh, from every nation and tribe and tongue and people, every background, every race, and gather, being able to gather here this morning to worship you, and we strive to do so, Father, in spirit and in truth. So please um, send your spirit to be with us here to invigorate our minds and our hearts that we would leave this place however we came into this building this morning, that we would leave uh, with courage in our hearts to meet the challenges that confront us on every side. So bless us to this end. We pray this is your time, Father, and we expect that you will meet with us this morning according to your perfect will in Jesus' name. Amen. Ron was a perfect child. I remember my mom telling me that. He was the perfect baby and almost never cried. He excelled in school. I remember her saying in hindsight that he was almost too good. Ron won the Columbia Union Temperance Oratorical Contest when he was a student at Tacoma Academy. He was popular, vice president of his senior class. He was the son that my parents hoped and dreamed would be the minister who followed in dad's footsteps. He had it all. Good looks, charm, a beautiful Christian experience. And did I forget the P word? Yes, he was perfect. These words were written by Connie Vandeman Jeffries regarding her brother Ron Vandeman. They were the daughter and son among the other children of George Vandeman, who was the pioneer of the It Is Written telecast and Adventist media ministry, uh, a ministry that continues on today under the leadership of John Bradshaw and touches many thousands of lives all over the world. In an article written in 2002, Connie pens these words describing her brother Ron, and she would go on to address a family secret. 
one that was published locally in uh, the news in Southern California, but was never publicly discussed by the Adventist media icon, and only vaguely referenced in his autobiography. On April 11th, 1985, George Vandeman nearly lost his life at the hands of his own son, Ron. As she writes in the Adventist Review, the whole incident lasted only a few minutes. Dad parked the car in the driveway, opened the garage door, and dashed into the house to get Ron. As he entered the house, he called out for Ron to come out to the car. Then Dad walked back out to the door to get into the car. In hindsight, I shudder to think what would have happened had he stayed in the house even a few more seconds. As he walked to the car, he felt a blow to the back of the head. Later, he said that he thought the garage door had fallen on him. The blows continued and propelled him into the street where he ended up lying, face down, in the gutter, at the end of the driveway. Ron was on top of him, brandishing a six-inch knife from the kitchen. At the exact moment that Dad was driving into his garage from the office, Harold Reiner was sitting at his computer at his home just a few blocks away. Instead of going to work at the Southern California Conference office that day, she says, he was working from home. Harold had been my father's associate years before at the General Conference and was a close family friend who knew of Ron's illness before its inception. As he was sitting in his study, he got a sudden, overwhelming feeling that he should go to Radio Shack. He got up from his computer and still in his bedroom slippers went to get in his car. He didn't even stop to put on his shoes. As he drove down his street to the intersection, he turned left instead of turning right, which was the shortest route to Radio Shack. And when he drove by my parents' home, just a few seconds later, he saw Ron stabbing at Dad repeatedly in the gutter and came to his aid and saved his life. My father was released from the hospital after only two days. Miraculously, he suffered only minor cuts and bruises on his face and back. The knife wound in his back had missed his vital organs by a fraction of an inch. Physically, he recovered in about two weeks. Emotionally, it took a while longer. Being assaulted by one's own child remains one of the most unfathomable things to comprehend, she says. This story was not addressed for more than 15 years. Connie d says herself that she did not feel that she could even tell this story until after her parents' death. When Ron was 21 years old, He had a nervous breakdown while in college and later was diagnosed with schizophrenia, a disease which can have similar symptoms but sometimes wildly divergent outcomes. It's compelled mothers to take the lives of their own children. And in the case of John Forbes Nash, he was inspired as a schizophrenic with radical thoughts that would lead him to become a Nobel laureate in mathematics, inspiring the movie A Beautiful Mind. Weeks before the attack in 1985, Ron had stopped taking his medication. His thoughts ran out of control, and he began to plot in taking the life of one or both of his parents. The hesitance 
for the Vandeman family to acknowledge their son's illness illustrates to us a stigma around mental health issues that is still present today. We don't like to talk about mental illness. We don't always know how to talk about mental illness. And so we don't talk about mental illness. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a problem to be addressed. A couple of years ago, a study was published indicating that 60%, 60% of college students have a diagnosable mental illness. Those numbers continue to increase year after year after year. Last week was Global Mental Health Day. Actually, last Sabbath was Global Mental Health Day. Um, I am not a day late and a dollar short. I'm a week late. Hopefully not seven dollars short. But uh, sometimes things happen, and you're aware of our recent absence, which sometimes throws a, a, a wrench in the, in the sermon schedule. Let's think about this this morning. Your brain is a bodily organ similar but different to any other one of your bodily organs which is necessary for your survival, which can experience abnormal, abnormal, abnorm, <laughs> abnormalities in a variety of different ways. You have heart problems. What is the core issue that causes those problems? Is it the muscle? Is it the valves? The vessels? Is it inflammation? Is it infection? Is it a congenital issue? Was it brought on by your lifestyle? Is there an underlying health issue that has nothing to do with your heart itself but is contributing to those issues? Same kinds of questions can be asked of issues relating to your brain and its ability to function. Depression is only one manifestation of mental illness, but it's a significant one in our society, and it's especially significant this time of year. With shorter days, with falling leaves, as beautiful as they are, pretty soon they will leave the trees uh, bare and spindly, the cooler weather. Because of all of these and a number of other factors, people tend to experience seasonal depression this time of year, which sometimes can last the entire winter and isn't mitigated until the days become longer in springtime. This is a real issue. This is a public health issue. And in the times that we're living in now, uh, add to those complications. Um, the coronavirus pandemic, a, an economy that for some has continued to push them below the poverty line. We're talking of millions of people in our country. Social isolation that results. The overwork of parents who are suddenly stressed out to the max because they're responsible for more of their children's education than they ever planned. And the stress of a brutal presidential cycle, which some commentators have suggested that could result in a constitutional crisis. It's a recipe for increased anxiety and depression, and none of us are immune from it. And now that the long, sunny summer days are gone, and winter, in fact, is coming, and we face the unknowns of that winter with uh, what appears to be, by the charts that I've looked at, a third spike in cases in the virus. We don't really know what to expect. If you are struggling with feelings of despair, you are not crazy. You might be crazy. I might be a little crazy. I've been called crazy. But not be necessarily because of that, okay? You are not crazy. You are not alone. You are a human being. 
living in the 21st century in the United States in the northern latitudes, where the summer days are long and the winter days are not long enough for some of us. You are not alone. The, the Bible records a number of passages of Scripture which aren't inspiring, but give us a, a, a sense that there's some camaraderie among people of faith. And these passages of Scripture are so important that the Holy Spirit felt the need to include them in the sacred record. Okay, Numbers chapter 14. Moses, just referencing this, you know, God's people, he's, he's leading the Israelites through the wilderness. He's supernaturally providing water. He's supernaturally providing manna from heaven to, to consume. And it says here, as they cried out for flesh to eat, Moses says, I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden, God, is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. <laughs> if I find favor in your sight, that I may not continue to see my own wretchedness in the situation that he found him in. He found death to be preferable than the life that he was experiencing. Jeremiah chapter 20, starting in verse 13, the Bible says, Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. But then he seemingly turns and he says in verse 14, Cursed be the day, though, on which I was born. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father that a son is born to you. In verse 18, he says, Why did I come out of the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? If you read through the book of Lamentations, you really get a sense of Jeremiah's sorrow, sorrow that resulted from his prophetic ministry, the personal implications of that ministry, how he was an outcast and rejected, th thrown in a cistern you know, by the king, um, and later penning those words of grief in what happened to God's people because they refused to receive his prophetic message of warning. David says in Psalm 69, verse 1, Save me, O God. For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary with crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with the waiting for my God, and he goes on to say, but as for me, in verse 13, my prayer is to you, O Lord. And he turns his cry out for help into a prayer. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit Close its mouth over me. Again, these are not the most inspiring <laughs> or uplifting verses. There's a very heavy vibe running through all of these passages of Scripture. But if you're struggling these days, it gives us confidence that we're not alone. And that the mighty men and women of Scripture, that their lives are recorded, struggled with God when they had these feelings. They wrestled with God in the same ways that sometimes we wrestle with God and we have the testimony that God delivered them. This morning, I'd like to take a cursory look at the case of Elijah. 
He is a man who was called by God, called to an incredible task by God. When the entire nation of Israel, in his view, had completely gone astray in unfaithfulness, the worshiping of idols, the offering of sacrifices on the high places to pagan deities, God raised up a man like Elijah to deal with this situation. So what does Elijah do? He goes to uh, the king of Israel and he does a little hit and run thing. Where he goes to the king and he says, Ahab, because of your unfaithfulness and the unfaithfulness of God's people, it's not going to rain and there won't be any dew for three years. Peace out. I'm going to Brook Cherith. He disappears. He's at the Brook Cherith. He's hanging out by the brook. Nobody knows where he is. He's public enemy number one. All of Israel's problems, though, resulted from their unfaithfulness. They're projecting them onto the one who delivered the truth to them. Ravens are bringing him food. Eventually, the brook dries up. God directs him to Zarephath where he meets a widow. She's on her last leg, so to speak. She has a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. She's going to make her cake. She's going to eat it. And then she's going to die as a result of this famine that is in the land. But God saw something valuable in her even though she was not uh, uh, one of God's professed people, the Israelites. And God sends Elijah to her door and through him provides plenty of food, flour that does not cease, oil that does not cease. Later on, when her son dies, it's Elijah that brings him by the grace of God back to life. Elijah is a man of faith, he's a man of principle, he's a man who walks with God, he's a man who has the privilege of seeing God's miracles in unfold in his own life and in the lives of other people. And God calls him back. Go back to Ahab. And Elijah obeys. And the result is likely one of the longest and most strenuous days of Elijah's life. We don't think about it that way. That's exactly what happens here. Let's trace the events. Ahab gathers a crowd at Mount Carmel. As the prophets and the people gather together, Elijah makes a strong appeal to the people. And he says, if Baal is God, serve him. But if Yahweh is God, serve him. How long are you going to try to hold this middle ground between truth and and error between worshiping of the creator God and worshiping idols who are nothing and only degrade you. They make an agreement that an offering should be made to the various deities and the one who answers by fire is the true God. And the prophets of Baal start First, And the Bible says that from the morning until noon time, they might have had to take a lunch break. And then from noon to the time of the evening sacrifice, about three o'clock in the afternoon, they, after putting the, the bull on the altar to Baal, they jumped around and they screamed. They cut themselves, the Bible says, until the blood started to freely flow in order to get the attention of the God that they worshipped and they were unsuccessful, as you would imagine. 
So probably a minimum of six hours later. Elijah calls the people close. He takes 12 large stones and he rebuilds the altar to God that had been neglected for years. After restoring the altar, he laid wood on that altar. After laying the wood on the altar, he sacrificed a bull and put that bull on the altar. Very costly offering. He dug a trench and had servants bring 12 jars of water to pour on that offering until the water flowed into the trench to make sure that everyone knew if this, if fire alighted on this offering, it must have been the almighty hand of God. He prayed a simple prayer that God would vindicate himself. And before he could say amen, fire thunders from heaven and consumes the offering. It consumes the wood. It consumes the stones. It consumes the water. And the Bible says it licked up the dust and it left a smoldering crater where that offering used to be. But the day wasn't over. And Elijah took the false prophets of Baal down to the brook and had them killed. He went up the mountain again to wait for an indication that rain would be restored. And when his servant said, there's a little dark cloud off in the distance, he went down and told Ahab. And in fact, knowing that a storm was coming, he took Ahab's horse and through torrential rain, ran 25 miles from Mount Carmel to Jezreel, leading Ahab's horse. He runs after all of the events of the day. He throws a marathon on top of that with probably a three-hour pace. Elijah is a man of faith. He's a man of courage. A man who walked with God. A man who saw miracles as a result of his ministry. But when he lands in Jezreel and he hears the words of Ahab's wicked wife Jezebel saying, Elijah, I'm going to do the same thing to you that you did to my prophets. Abraham was seized with fear. And he turns and he runs. Not 25 miles back to Carmel, but the 100-mile stretch south to Beersheba and he collapses underneath a broom tree the Bible says after leaving his servant behind in town and he says God it's all been too much for me just let me die You know, the Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 17, that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Prophets are human beings. 
why do we take the time to review this story? To see that these kinds of feelings, this sense of desperation and despair can come upon anyone. And though you may be sensing those kinds of feelings, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. If it happened to these great men of old, these victors and these powerful prophets and these men who gave their life and changed the course of history and whose stories were recorded in this book, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, or as the King James says, he was compassed with passions like ours. He has an incredible experience, but then it seems like he drifts into despair. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this in the way I have. I've gone to, to uh, conferences that were tremendously inspirational. And, and I leave with this sense of, of, of an understanding of God and his will and his purpose for my life. And you get home and, and there's this kind of something that creeps in. You know, you can't live on the mountaintop forever. We tend to be vulnerable after these very intense experiences in our lives. Even good spiritual experiences. Something good happens to your life. You gain a victory in your life. Things tend to be moving forward. There's, a, there, there, there's something that makes us vulnerable after those intense experiences. Spiritual victories, mountaintop experiences. Perhaps for some of us, it's the surge of stress and excitement that always comes before the holidays. And you're busier than you'd care to be, but you're running around, you're purchasing gifts, you're going to office Christmas parties, you're trying to hide stuff from your kids, you're sending out Christmas cards, you're receiving Christmas cards, and then all of a sudden in mid-January, you're down in the dumps and you're wondering what in the world happened. Well, life happened. That, in, that, that, that intensity you know, that starts picking up around... Um, thanksgiving time and then increases around christmas and the new years and then february comes around you're back at work and you're just you're not feeling so hot anymore that's normal it happened to elijah or when a relationship suddenly and unexpectedly ends or even when the shadows grow long after a bright and sunny summer. These are the rhythms of life. And we need to be aware of these rhythms of life so that these things don't catch us off guard and we're tempted to think that we are experiencing something abnormal when really we're experiencing something that's very normal, that's very commonplace. We just don't often talk about it. I will tell you that I am very proud of the work that our denomination has been doing in the area of mental health. Um, Dr. Neil Nedley has done a lot of work in the last several years, even producing a, a depression and anxiety recovery program which local churches like ours can implement and offer to the community. I've had the privilege of receiving some training and serving as a local director from some of those programs, and I've seen lives transform. This is a tool that, that, that Adventists of faith desiring to help and serve other people have produced and is changing lives. Not long ago, while I was serving at the denominational headquarters in Maryland, I was sitting uh, in a business meeting where church leaders had come from all over the world, and a an individual was recommended to serve as an associate health ministries director for the World Seventh-day Adventist Church. The first, uh, he, his name's Torben Berglund, he's a Northern European, and he is the first Associate Health Ministries Director for the Global Adventist Church who has a background in mental health. He's a, he's a psychiatrist and specializes in the area of mental health. And I believe that the church 
is going to be doing a lot more in the coming years regarding the issue of mental health. And you can be proud that some of those initiatives are taking place in this church. And resources will be trickling down to us to help us to bless and encourage and serve not only each other, but hurting people in our community. Like Elijah, we have a tendency to not take care of ourselves. As he fled Jezebel and he found a refuge, a place to sleep under that broom tree, God, in his mercy, sent an angel to that discouraged prophet, cooked him a meal, gave him something to drink. He fell asleep, and after a little while, the angel said, you're not done. <laughs> you need to get up and eat again. You're going to go on a further journey, and you need this supernatural sustenance that the angel provided for him, nurturing not only the body, but also the soul of this discouraged prophet. And that empowered him to go on to Horeb and have a supernatural, transformative encounter with God. Just as the angel gave Elijah something to eat, there are very practical things that can help us get through these cycles and these rhythms of life. I'm not a doctor. Do not take my advice without talking to your doctor. But if we understand that, can I share a couple things with you that have helped me? Is that okay? Uh, Elijah had something to eat, and it's important for us to have something helpful to eat as well. Three supplements that I found are very powerful when taken together upon the recommendation of Dr. Neil Nedley is number one, omega-3 essential fatty acids. And that can come in the form of fish oil or flax oil. You can grind up some flax seed and mix it with a little fruit juice and do a tablespoon of it in the morning. Very essential for cognitive function. Another thing that helps a lot is vitamin B9, folate. Uh, it's found in uh, beans and in dark, leafy green vegetables. It's incredibly potent and very helpful. In fact, Dr. Nedley says that there was a pharmaceutical company who was producing an antidepressant. And what they did was they, they produced a compound that was structurally similar to vitamin B9 and tried to patent it. And I think the FDA came back and said, you can't do that. It's, 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 it's basically vitamin B9. You can't patent a vitamin. So take your B9, take folate, take folic acid. Some of you, and I just mentioned this because this last summer, I did a blood test and found out that I have a genetic mutation that runs in my family that I don't process B9 like other people. It's MTHFR uh, mutation, so I have to take methylfolate. And guess what happened when I started taking methylfolate? I had energy levels. I felt much better taking these three things, folate and omega-3 essential fatty acids and having a diet that has adequate tryptophan. Now, we know about tryptophan from Thanksgiving turkey, right? Everybody says you eat too much turkey on Thanksgiving, and then you go for a snooze afterwards. Well, there are a lot of other things that carry levels of tryptophan uh, more so than, than turkey. An easier way to get it would be to take 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is the precursor for, with light stimulation, your body produces serotonin and you feel good with dark dark stimulation the circadian rhythms your biological clock the sun starts to set your body takes that same precursor and produces melatonin which helps you sleep those three things were tremendously powerful uh, for me in helping elevate my mood I should say this and again I'll say don't don't make any changes without talking to your doctor if you've been prescribed something by your doctor for your your mental health then especially a, uh, a selective serotonin re 
reuptake inhibitor SSRI, then you probably shouldn't be taking 5-HTP because you can actually have too much serotonin, which is more dangerous than not having enough. So again, talk to your doctor. What's another thing? Elijah, the angel, came and lit a fire. Of course he, of course he ate off of that fire, but I can't help but to wonder if there was some positive light stimulation that took place uh, from that. Does anyone else besides me have a, a, a little blue light to help beat the winter blues? Anybody else? Little, little Phillips light here that you can get on, uh, on Amazon. Turn this thing on while you're eating breakfast. And... Uh, the blue light, just keep it on the side, and it helps when we're not getting a lot of sun, sunlight and, uh, and blue light waves to have something like this will make a tremendous difference, especially first thing in the morning when the darkness of the morning kind of, kind of lingers on just to keep your, your circadian rhythms, your natural uh, body clock moving in the right direction. There was a town in Norway uh, down in a valley, and a person that was living there tells a story in the Atlantic magazine of in the winter time looking up at one of the valley walls, and they could tell that winter was coming because the light would increasingly work up the valley wall until you would only see it with the sun being very, very low um, in the southern sky. You would just see a skiff of sunlight up on the mountain while the valley was cloaked in darkness. You know what that city did? They constructed three mirrors up on the mountaintop. Those mirrors were about 190 square feet each. And those mirrors would catch that sunlight and broadcast it down to the village square, and in the middle of the day, you'd see villagers coming out almost as this daily ritual to just hang out in the sunshine. It's tremendously therapeutic. There are places above the Arctic Circle where it's almost like a public utility. You can go into the light box and turn on the light and get your daily dose of light for the day and light stimulation because it's proven to make a significant difference in people's mental health. Vitamin D is also related to this. We're, we're bundled up. We're not getting you know, the natural sunlight on our skin. And when the sun is so far south, it's not even enough on a bright winter's day to have enough vitamin D uh, 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 produced naturally in your body upon light stimulation. So vitamin D is also very helpful. Cardiovascular exercise, if you can get out and get it, is incredibly helpful to elevate your mood. And almost lastly, but certainly not least, don't be afraid to talk to someone. Don't be afraid to talk with your doctor um, my first Michigan winter, I was a member of this church. It was the hardest winter of my life, looking back. I was uh, living in, in Colorado and then in southern Utah. Uh, I was riding my mountain bike year-round, enjoying the winter sun. We're talking upwards of, of, of 300 days of full sun every year in the Mountain West activities all year long and then we moved here and I came here to finish my degree at uh, at Wayne State so not only you know I was expecting you know this is the, this is the this is the north midwest bring on the snow it wasn't until we moved to Grand Haven that we really got to enjoy you know the heavy consistent you know, snow falling for two weeks at a time. My philosophy is if it's going to be cold, it might as well be white. Instead of cold and everything is kind of brown and dingy. But we moved here and I'm driving in and out of the, of, you know, driving to the cast corridor every day. That's depressing enough, you know. And uh, at least it was at the time coming out of the housing crisis and everything else. It was tremendously depressing. When we moved to the other side of the state and I went to a doctor, I discovered that I had an autoimmune thyroid disorder. That it's also genetic, that my mom has, and that other members of my family have. And when I began to be treated for that, 
Uh, my mom describes it when you first start, start taking, you know, Synthroid or other thyroid hormone. It feels like you're walking out of a dark room. And I still remember when I started taking the appropriate medicine and I began to get the hormones that I needed to function. And it made a tremendous difference in my life. So if you're not feeling quite right, it might be something else that you have that is not diagnosed. And that was certainly my case. Now lastly, and the most important, to trust in God. You've got to trust in God. Believing that he's good, believing that he knows our frame, that he's given us messages of encouragement in these books to not neglect our, our, our time with him, that we have the promise that God will send us help when, he, when we need it most, just as he sent that angel to Elijah to provide for his needs at his darkest hour. If we have given ourselves to God, we can trust that he will care for us. And in the words of the psalmist, we can echo with him in Psalm chapter 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction. Do you remember that pit of destruction? The mire, the waves crashing over his head, feeling like he was going to be swallowed up. David says here in verse 40 that, that he drew me up from the pit of destruction out of that miry bog and he set my feet upon the solid rock making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many, as a result, will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege to read this book and to get a sense this morning that we are not alone. That we this morning can resist the idea of, of mental health being stigmatized and not talking about it when your word addresses these human struggles. Help us to have the courage to address them with our friends, with our loved ones, advocating on behalf of ourselves. Father, I pray that you would help us as much as possible to, to be of good courage, trusting in you, taking advantage of very simple means to help elevate our mood. But Father, help us to know when we need to reach out for help. Guide us and bless us. Keep us strong as we go into this dark winter. I pray that this church would be a shining light of hope and of healing for this community and that your members here, that we would experience your goodness. And while there are many, many reasons to despair and to give up hope, that we would cling ever closer to our Savior and we would experience the abundant life that he desires to give. Thank you, Father. Guide, bless us, help us, keep us in good courage and ever moving forward while we wait for you to make all things new. We don't have to worry about getting enough sunlight or vitamin B9 or these other things because we're living and dwelling with you in your kingdom restored. That's what we're looking forward to as Seventh-day Adventists, and we believe that you will bring that about very soon. May we meet you in peace on that day is our prayer this morning. We thank you.